Today, we're gonna to talk about your stream mix and how you can use compression to help get it under control so that people aren't texting you saying it's too loud and it's too quiet and it's distorted. We'll get it nice and even for you and you'll thank me later. As you may have noticed, your stream mix can't have a lot of dynamic range or you'll get people turning it up and turning it down on the other end, or it's distorted in some sections and too quiet in other sections. And we don't wanna deal with that. We wanna give people what they want to listen to on the other end and what works for their device that they're listening through. So maybe you know a little bit about compression, and so you put a compressor on the output of your stream mix, thinking that's gonna take care of the dynamic range changes between the loud and the quiet sections. Unfortunately, that doesn't always work very well. And here's why. If the mix going into a stereo compressor isn't balanced just right, it can make things out of whack with the compressor and the compressor can make things worse rather than better. The drums can cause the compressor to pump in a weird way or the vocals are too far out in front and it causes the compressor to push down everything else in the mix, making it feel like it's a vocal solo. And that's distracting. We don't wanna do that for the listeners on the other end. When our compressor is behaving badly like that, we need to send it to timeout. Time. Time. time, time, Attack and release time. That's what we need to talk about. Our compressor will respond to the increased input to know how much to turn it down. The attack time tells the compressor how quickly to push the signal down after it goes up above the threshold and continues to go up. The release time is how quickly or slowly that gain reduction comes back up as the signal goes down a little bit. All that's really easy to understand if we have a simple audio input going into our compressor. But our music mix with drums, vocals, guitars, and keyboards, not to mention the bass, isn't quite that simple. Musical signals have a blend of transient or percussive elements and elements that sustain as well. And each of those are gonna interact with the compressor's attack and release time in a different way. Throw all that together with live vocals and it's hard to get a compressor on your stereo output to behave the right way. So one thing that I like to do is to compress in stages. Because of all these competing factors it can make it really easy for your mix to get off the rails going into a compressor. So let's listen to some examples of what that's like. All right, so I've got a mix here and it's set up the way that I have a front of house mix set up on my drums got my compression attack times slow, like I like it nice and punchy. You know, we'll experiment with the vocals over here being out front or not too far out in front. So we'll try that. Let me take that gate off real quick. And we'll see what happens when we go to our stereo bus and we start to compress. So let's take a listen. Jesus be All right, so the way that those drums are making the compressor pump is not really helping our mix glue together. Remember, we're trying to get rid of dynamic range, not create weird pumping artifacts. So that's what happens when the drums are too far out in front. Most front of house mixes have the vocals far out in front. And that's just normal because we have a lot of reflections and other people singing to overcome. Let's listen to what it's like when we try to compress it with our vocals out in front of the mix. All right, this is not helping either. I'm not really loving it, but maybe you say the attack and the release time on the stereo bus compressor are what's really giving us problems. So let's still go there. I'll make my attack and release time much slower and we'll go and see what that's like. See if that fixes the problem or if it's just, you know, a Band-Aid on a broken leg. Here we go. All right, that's less distracting, but it's still not gonna get us all the dynamic range change that we want to take care of that really dynamic front of house mix and how it should sound at the dynamic range of the broadcast. So this is not working. So most of the time, just throwing a compressor on your stereo bus isn't gonna work. 
you know, haven't figured that out already. Great audio is a game of baby steps, so one of the things that we can do to help combat this pumping compressor on our stereo output is to take care of the transients on the drums. Now, in live sound, I love big, fat transients that hit you in the chest, especially from the kick and the snare. But that doesn't really work well in a broadcast environment where we have to tame the dynamic range a little bit. So to split the difference and to still get big sounding drums, I will use compressors on my drums that have a faster attack time. This tames those transients that are gonna mess with my output compressor, but it still retains the impact and the feeling of the drums being big and in your face. One compressor style that I really like for this is the 1176 models. They might also be labeled FET compressors, but the particular way they designed this compressor is to work very, very fast, where the slowest attack time is 800 nanoseconds, which is under one millisecond, which is faster than most standard compressors have as their fastest attack time. The thing you have to look out for when using very fast attack times on drums is that you don't completely squash it away. So be careful not to use too much gain reduction and use plenty of makeup gain to make sure that you get the level back up enough so that if you bypass the compressor and kind of A, B on and off, whether or not you like it, it's not going away or disappearing when you turn the compressor on. We'll play around with the attack or the input and the output. That's basically our threshold and our makeup gain, but in an odd way. I've got the attack as slow as it'll go. I've got the release as fast as it'll go. And then let's listen to it, how it can destroy it, and then how it can make it better. And then later we'll listen to how it sounds different when we're compressing our stereo bus. We'll do it on the kick and the snare. Bypass it. So if you don't use enough makeup gain, let's say you were using a traditional compressor that had makeup gain as opposed to having to in increase the input and turn down the output. If you have too much gain reduction and then you're output level is much lower, that can make it sound like it doesn't feel as good. So that's why some people will say, oh, 1176 on kick, that's no good. But you've just got to get the makeup gain right. Let's bypass it and put it in when it's wrong so then you can hear more what it's like when it's right. Yeah, nobody's going to like that more. So it's really important that you get your output gain at the right spot when you're compressing really fast transients like this. Okay, so clearly this is too far and it's not good anymore. So you can't absolutely crush it to death and still expect it to sound good. So watch out for that when you're doing the 1176 on the kick. Let's try it on the snare too, just cause I've got it queued up and it's fun. We're really just taking off the real peak of the snare. This isn't necessarily my favorite on this snare drum, but you get kind of the idea. 
this can take off the edge of those transients. So they can be up, they can be there, but they will play nicer with your stereo bus compressor. Let's go ahead and take a look at that in the midst of the rest of the mix now. All right, now you can hear that the kick and snare are there, but you don't see them pushing down on the gain reduction of the stereo bus as much. That lets us push them up further, gives us the impression that the kick and snare are there without them really having to be punchy. It's one of the things you sacrifice when running front of house and broadcast at the same time, but that's one tip to take it up to the next level. Now, if you wanna compare two mixing styles on a drum kit, there's two albums that I want you to look at from John Mayer. The first one is Heavier Things. The other one is Continuum. On Heavier Things, the drums are really in your face, but they don't quite have the same impact. And you don't really notice it until you listen to it back to back with the album Continuum. On Continuum, you can hear how they use maybe no compression at all or very slow attack times to let those initial transients and that impact strike through. While I can gush over the engineering and mixing of Continuum, and I could go on for days about how good it feels, they took a long time and really dialed in every drum sound, every drum hit, to get it just perfect for that record. If you're mixing a live broadcast, you don't have that kind of time and attention, and you probably don't have Steve Jordan on the drums. If you do though, drop me a comment and I would love to talk to you. Now the other factor that we have is keeping our vocals tucked back into what's called the vocal pocket. The vocal pocket is the connection between the band and the vocals. If our vocals are tucked too far back, you'll get people texting you that they can't hear the vocals and that's the most important input. So you really should get the vocals right. If you watch your stereo bus compressor and you notice that the gain reduction meter is lighting up a lot more when the vocals are in and a lot less when the vocals aren't in, that's probably a clue that you've got too much level in your mix going to that stream. Now, I know a lot of you are probably mixing on headphones because it's tricky to get a separate setup and a separate studio monitors and a quiet room to be able to mix in. So if you're mixing a live stream mix in headphones, I recommend doing it in mono. And I know that sounds counterintuitive, but if you mix in mono and keep the vocals just out in front, that'll be enough so that you're not pushing too hard into that streaming compressor on the output. Now the final tip I'll leave with you is to use buses or groups to compress groups of your inputs together before they go to the streaming bus compressor. This allows each stage of compression to do just a little bit of work instead of having each one have to lift a lot to get your dynamic range in a place where it's suitable on the other end. The details for that are part of my broadcast mixing course, but you can find details on how to get that through the link in the description below. As of the time of publishing this video, I'm reworking the course all together. So if you sign up now, you'll get the current course and the new one when it comes out. If you liked this video, mash thumbs up and hit subscribe. And remember, it's all about the low end, avoid the sound tech solo, and nobody leaves humming the kick drum. We'll see you back here next time on Attaway Audio.